Number four. In sin, we become debtors by this means. All the good we have, whether natural or supernatural, we are betrusted with as so many talents, and for abusing of these or not improving of them, we become debtors unto God. You have a full parable to this purpose, Matthew 25, where you have every opportunity, even the least that God puts into our hands, compared to a talent, and that for the greatness and preciousness of it. And a man may be accountable unto God, either propter daminum, emergence, for the loss that comes to our master therein, or for lucrum cessans, the very ceasing of gain as that servant who hid his talent in a napkin and returned it safe again. Though he was not guilty of any prodigal decoction of it, yet he is called a wicked and unprofitable servant. Now because all our talents are many, hence our debts do arise to an infinite sum, none so indebted as those who have great wealth, great parts. Psychet, crescunt, donna, sic crescunt, reshuns, donorum. The more mercies, the greater account to be given. This consideration may deeply humble us. As our sins are thus debts, so we have all naturally the evil properties and wicked customs of ill debtors. Number one, we are very unwilling to be called to any account. We do not love to hear of the day of judgment. We love not that the ministers of God should tell us of our bills and handwritings that are against us. Hence some observe that expression, Matthew 18, verse 24, when the master begun to reckon, it is said, one was brought that owed ten thousand talents, as if it were by force, and he was hailed to his master. Into what in amazement and astonishment will that voice from heaven put us into? Give an account to thy stewardship. Unless Christ be our surety, and he undertake to discharge all, so that the very word debts may breed in us much love to Christ, who is willing to stand engaged for us. Phocian, the Athenian, Coming to one in public office that was very solicitous about giving up his accounts, and saith he, I am solicitous how I may give no account at all. Thus, if it were possible, would every man be studious how he may decline that day of accounts. How gladly would he have the grave to detain him there always. Number two, to be full of shame and fear, thus are men in debt, desirous to lie latinitat and not be seen. Grave vocabulum debitorum, said Ambrose. The name of debts is very dreadful and terrible. Hence Ambrose speaketh of some who, for the shame and distress thereof, have made away for themselves, fearing more opprobrium vitae than mortis periculum, the reproach of life, than the punishment of death. Sudius speaks of a proverb in lit. A. Hepats, Puros, Kai, Decaton, Cluace. Once red with blushing at the time of borrowing, and afterwards ten times pale for fear of paying. Canis, Laterat, and Cor, Tum, Palpitat. The dog doth bark, and thy heart feareth an arrest. And if men have been thus perplexed about worldly debts, when yet death would at last release them, how much more may men be afraid of these spiritual debts? There was a certain Roman died in a vast sum of debts, which in his lifetime he concealed, and after his death, when his goods were to be sold, Augustus the emperor sent to buy his pillow he lay upon, because, saith he, I hope that would make me sleep, on which a man so much indebted could take his ease. It is much that we who have so many debts spiritual can sleep or eat or drink till we see them discharged by Christ. Oh, that every natural man should not like Cain fear everything would damn him. Number three, to shift and put off, to be in continual delays, and if so, to be no further troubled. This is a custom in worldly debts. If men can shift one way or other, they care not. Hence Horace calls the wicked debtor Scalaterus, Proteus, fiat, aper, modum, avis, modo, faxum, and cum volat arbor. Become in all shapes to evade the creditor, and thus it is in spiritual debts. How unwilling to acknowledge our debts, to confess them to God. 
I look upon all Pelagian doctrines on the one side and antinomian opinions on the other side, which would either make no sin in us, or at least not to be taken notice of by God, but as so many cozening cheats of a guilty heart that is unwilling to be found a debtor before God, cum delationem im petroveris gaudis, said Ambrose of a debtor. If men can but delay, they do rejoice. And are we not all thus naturally affected? if we can from day to day get one worldly comfort after another, and so be able to support ourselves, we think all is well. It air, uh, hey there, excuse me, dux ea patin te axkai apadoth. Nothing is more troublesome than to hear, pay what thou owest. Do not, therefore, please thyself with delays and excuses, lest thou die in thy misery. Number four. To hate those to whom we are indebted. Leave as alienum debitorum facet grave. Animicum. A little money borrowed makes a man a debtor, but a great deal an enemy. And so the more they owe, the more they hate. Hoi obsalantis bello ta May, Eni, Hois, Afe la soy, said Aristotle. Debtors wish their creditors to have no being. Such is the hatred that ariseth thereby, and this is most eminently true in wicked men. They hate God because they fear him as a just judge, who will severely demand to the last farthing. Comfortable, therefore, is this direction to pray in this petition, for hereby I suppose that God is propitious and ready to release us. We may have a jubilee every day. No devil hath any warrant to say, Forgive us our sins. God hath cast them into utter darkness, and bound them up in per perpetual chains for their debts, but he is ready to forgive us. And therefore we read of David, that men in debt and distress followed him, hoping thereby to be freed from their creditors' hands. So let us follow Christ, who only is able to take off this heavy burden from us, and know the longer we lie in our debts, the more they will increase upon us. Now, in two respects, spiritual debts do exceed worldly debts. Number one, in danger of non-payment. Suppose the highest punishments that we read of in history is against perfidious debtors. Yet that doth not amount to the punishment of our spiritual debts. In some laws they were bound to sell their children, yea, themselves, to become slaves. Exodus 21, verse 7. Exodus 22, verse 2. Second Kings 4, verse 1. Thus God commanded in the Jewish laws. This was very miserable, to have children sold for parents' debts. Valentinian the emperor would have such put to death that were not able to pay their debts. But above all, that law in the twelve tables, that who was in debt the creditors might take him, and cause him to be cut alive in as many pieces as the creditors pleased. This cruelty, saith Tertullian, was afterwards erased out by public consent. Sassudere, Melit, Homini, Sanguinem, quam, asunder. But what is this to that? Matthew 18, verse 30. His master was wroth and delivered him the tormentor, the two the tormentors, till he had paid all that was due. So then chains and imprisonments are the worst of worldly debts, but the eternal wrath of God falleth upon spiritual debts. Number two. In the impossibility of escaping this punishment, in these debts, death will free a man. But then is the beginning of our misery by spiritual debts. So Matthew 5, verse 26, Thou shalt by no means come out, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. And because we are never able to do that, therefore must our condemnation be eternal. We pity the indebted prisoners, that out of their grates cry, Bread, bread. But how more doleful is that cry of dives out of hell for a drop of water, and none giveth unto him. This is some mitigation, uh, this is some mitigating consideration to the worst troubles here, that they are not eternal. And it is the aggravation of the least in hell, that they are eternal. Therefore, in that the scripture calls our sins by these names, we have an innumerable heap of them. Let us mourn under the weight of them, and bewail their burden. And this is to be done with all speed, not knowing how soon justice may take us by the throat, saying, Pay that thou owest. The use may be of instruction to the godly, that notwithstanding their justification and forgiveness of sins past, yet they run into debt daily, and such debts as for the pardon of them, they must renew daily sorrow and confession, as also sue 
without continual pardon. For certainly our Savior did not direct us to say this petition humiliter only, for humility's sake, as some of the old thought, but also verisider, truly, and if it be true, then we are not in a cold customary way of lukewarmness to beg this pardon, but with the same deep sense, conflict, and agony of spirit as we see malefactors importune the judge for a pardon. Now if there were a malefactor that thought the judge saw no crimes, nor matter of death in him, but on the contrary that he was altogether righteous and free, how could this man with any deep remorse and acknowledgment bewail himself, so that this petition containeth excellent doctrine as well as practice? Tertullian called the Lord's Prayer, Breviarum Evangelii, a breviary or sum of the gospel, for legum credendi, adi and operandi, lex statute supplicandi, said another, the law or rule of prayer teacheth the rule of faith and practice. And this is very true in this petition, which teacheth both doctrine and practice against the antinomians. It is true they make glosses upon this text, but such cursed ones as do wholly corrupt it. Do not therefore think that justification giveth thee such a quietus s that new daily that new sins daily committed by thee should be no matter of humiliation or confession. Certainly our Saviour's command is that we should desire this forgiveness as often as we do our daily bread.